two. Okay, and that's the truth. 8 8 1960. Alright? I was black haired when I came here seven months ago. Look at the state of me now. And I'm still missing my time in the carriage. Right then. Game on. I'm not quite sure that this is going to work, but I'm assuming you've all got some questions. I want questions, please, not statements. Alright? Is that fair enough? And I'll answer the questions as directly as you ask them. Okay? Far away. There's going to be a guy walking around the road in Mike, and he'll follow you. The first one's all the way at the back. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening, uh, Norman. Um, I don't really like to ask the question, but I feel as though uh, it's necessary. A lot of people out there are uh, fuzzy. Uh, will admit it or not, I'll worry. The circumstances with Paul going, I think it's uh, brought the boat a little bit, bearing in mind with what we've had to put up with over the last couple of years. So just for um, information's sake, A, can you tell us a little bit of, uh, about Norman Smithwaite himself, where you originate from, what your working background is, and that... <coughs> Don't go into too much detail, but it does lead to the big question that obviously your background leads you to uh, your business, uh, your business um, credentials, and basically how you acquired your wealth. <laughs> uh, we, we don't mean, uh, obviously not leading to uh, putting Colonel Abrahams out of business, but uh, when it comes around to um, the financial situation, um, are we talking that your wealth accumulates to more than 50 million, less than 50 million? <laughs> That's what everybody wants to know. Does Norman Smith have the money, the finances to take the poor bail forward? Because that is what worries people. Paul's not here, Norman is. Norman, come on, tell us. <laughs> Respectfully, it's a bit late, isn't it? <laughs> seven months a bit late. Did you not think to ask these questions seven months ago? Didn't have the option. Didn't have the what, sorry? Didn't have the option. Well, you had the option. You all we held one of these forums seven months ago. We made you remember it. There wasn't just a cross test. What, sorry? Um, I, I beg to differ with that. We chose to... We were the only ones that actually had any money. Okay? We're the only horse in the race. So, let's, you know, let's not get carried away with this. No, I was just referring to the fact that we were saying we should have asked that question. No, 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 no. But there was a famous forum after we bought the club. I barely remember it. I sat in the chair like this. Paul <laughs> sat up like this, on the mic like this, as the photographs show. And you asked questions then were nowhere near as detailed and as difficult as that one. <laughs> so I say it's a bit late. But we'll uh, try and catch up, shall we? Yeah. Uh, I'm 52, I think I already said that. I originated from Coventry. Okay, please don't hold it against me. I was a supporter of Coventry City in a club very similar to this, a place called Highfield Road. I was born in a house very similar to the ones that back onto this ground. I lived in an area very similar to Burslem. I was kicked out on left hand, depending on which way you were, what school you wanted to visit to, when I was 16. My father was a very hard man and uh, gave me a really difficult upbringing and I chose to leave before he killed me. <laughs> and that's fact. You'll find the most successful people, they have something that drives them. Drives them beyond and wanted to fail. And mine was my father to prove that I was better than he described me. Being the best part going down his leg for me, you know the expression. Okay? So I left on number 16. I bought my first house when I was 16 and a half. Not intentionally, but I cut the tip off my finger. Um, I'm an engineer. I served my time at the Dunlop in Coventry. I bought my first house at 16 and a half because I couldn't see the point of renting. I'm a great believer in ownership. I went into the business when I was 20. I came out of my apprenticeship in the Dunlop in Coventry. I realised I was unemployable. I was actually sleeping with the union community's daughter at the time. And it reminded me of the fact that I didn't marry, I didn't have a job. So I didn't have much options anyway, so I had to leave. I went into the business when I was 25, a very tragic set of circumstances. 
as a kid and growing up, I was uh, into engineering and I'm a big model railway fanatic. I, I, like, I used to build model railways, the real steam deal, not these models, this plastic rubbish. And there's a guy who should have been my father who defended me very young in life, and actually educated me in engineering. Well, now, when I was 20, just over I was 20, sadly, he died prematurely, only about 61, 62. And at the time, the book just came out to his widow, Dorothy Besser, who's also now died. And she didn't know, she didn't even know what the business was in fairness, so she used, there wasn't supermarkets then, but she used to get her weekly money off Ted, up to May, and go off and do whatever she did. And he had a lovely little engineering business in Coventry, of which I spent most of my summer holidays, from about seven until I was 19 or 20, working in. And he died, which was tragic. And she came to me, well, she went to my dad first and said, can you have a word with Norman? My dad was called Norman as well, he was an engineer. I need to speak to young Norman. Uh, and so I went to see her, bless her. I used to go there every Sunday for my tea from when I was a kid up to about 18, and the girls were looking for a priority over the teas at my dad's house. And um, she said, I'm in this terrible dilemma of Ted's died, which we knew. I've got this business which all these people want to buy off me for nothing. I'd rather give it to you, Norman, than give it to those people who didn't want to call that for either. I've just left work, because as I say, there's a few minutes for me now, show me the door. And I said, well, Dorothy, I haven't got the means to buy this business. I'm nowhere near what it's worth. But she said, Norman, you can have it. I said, no, we'll do, we'll do a deal. I'll agree some with you now. Whatever they've offered you, I'll guarantee that within three years I'll double it, or I won't, I won't sell it until such times I can. And I saw the company two years later, gave her what she had, and I had a couple hundred thousand in my hand. That was, in, that was 1981, that's two years after Magda came to power. I was 21. <coughs> I then have bought numerous businesses since then, and still own several businesses now. Um, I'm the kind of guy I drive two miles out of my way to save two minutes I need to refuel. Okay? If you're going to judge me what my car I drive, I'm sorry I've failed. Because I read on one of the websites, and I have read Work Bell one over the weekend, so if you're the numbers that have put all this lovely dialogue on, okay, I've read it all. Because my wife drives a Volkswagen Polo, which is £20 road from the 60 to the gallon, I've got no money. Okay? <laughs> Can I give you a piece of free advice? I never give free advice. If you want to check somebody for what they're worth, and this is not aimed at anybody, but it's just a piece of free advice. And you know where they live, it costs you four pounds to find out what they pay for the house, if they've got a mortgage on it or not. If you want to know something about a person's car, you can HPI it and tell you if it's got a loan on it or not. Simple basic rules about people. People with money don't have debt. So, and I have no debt. Okay? I don't want to go through my whole career life, because I think that's... But I bought this club. I'm the guy who broke the money out to buy the club. That is not in contention. But I didn't say I had to walk around with a t-shirt saying Smurfs take the veil. Okay? Didn't think you wanted it, and I didn't think it was necessary. But that's a fact. I put the money in to buy the club. I put it in for a vehicle which is now it's called Alchemy. And I was out in Portugal when Paul was, because Paul's, I backed Paul on many investments in the last three years. I've only known Paul for three years. I put a lot more money behind Paul than I did buy this football club. And hopefully most of those investments will turn good in the future and give me a good return. And that's how I met Paul, as a, from a venture capital company, who was looking for people to put money behind his ideas. And I was the biggest one, both physically and financially, it came to the fore. I put a lot of money behind it. And then one day, the hairdressers of one of many that we own, which are now part of Alchemy, I was having a haircut and he came in to see me and said, I'm going to Stoke on trend, it's good for you. Best thing about Stoke is the A500, it goes around it quickly. <laughs> and he said, um, I, might, I might want you if you're interested. I said, well, I'm going away for a couple of weeks. Give me a shout for the evening. And he called me back into the country to come to the Gillingham game. I'm looking at the girl right at the back now. She knows what's coming next before she gets all me fish. Well, I came to the Gillingham game, okay, to a club I'd never heard of. I vaguely remember the name as a kid in the Saturday afternoon resorts. For those of you who remember how the guy at the time had that beautiful voice, called you one, Arsenal 10, or whatever it was. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd never really heard of Paul Mayer. I didn't know what to expect. When I drove off Hamill Road, I thought, my God, what am I doing here? <laughs> All right? There was nobody here because I was early. 
There was nobody in the car park. I was here at 11 o'clock. It was deserted. I thought, my gosh, there's only enough people to watch the football. But I walked up the steps. And as soon as I started walking up the steps, I thought, hello, something different. I mean, and it caught me then. I, like, I hadn't even got to the top of the stairs. We were in box 40, the full a box I even now own, the club now I can't even sit in. We were in box 14, and a certain young lady came in the search of sandwiches and chips. And I had a feeling about this place, which is something you can't put your finger on and you can't buy. Well, I wish you did. And I watched the game of football where we got beat. And Paul turned around to me and said, What do you think? I said, I love it, and left. And the rest of it is history, as I say. I was out of the country when we became preferred bidders, even though I didn't know we were even processed. So if you didn't want us, whoever that gentleman said we had no choice, you should have said, then no, we don't want this guy. I was out of the country until the money was needed and also the football league meetings. So I came back to the country for that. It was my finances which was determined if we could buy the club or not. It was me that they interrogated. I'll give you a little story about how that went just before because that dragged out for some weeks, and it's very frustrating for me for different reasons. I had a phone call from the lawyer representing the sale. We've got a bit of a problem, Lord. The bank statement you've given, the Football League think it's a forgery. That's really. It's an online account, they think you've doctored it. It's a crime, doctored it. And you've got it. And I was on the trainer, by the way, from London coming to here to a game. I can't remember which game it was. You've got to get a genuine statement to get it stamped and authenticated by a branch in Santander to prove that it is the real deal and not just something you've made up. But this shows you what other people have been doing prior to us coming on board regarding authenticity of what money they've got. So I get off the train at Coventry, which is my home city, walks up to Santander, stands in the queue of everybody else, and come to the front of the counter. The young lad's there, and I said, Can I have this here? I've got this, if I had the passport and driver license, thank you. And he said, Can I have this? He said, I need you to go into this particular account, I'll give the account number, and actually look at, check that account, print off the statement, stamp it, and sign it. Oh, okay, the usual request. I said, yes, it's an unusual request, but that's, if you could do that. But now, by this time, the QBR is getting bigger. So everything was fine until you opened up my account. The next minute, then, the manager and all the staff around his desk thinking I was going to close this account. <laughs> That got the toes up, by the way. I got them to do the account, detail, stamp it, take the money, uh, take the statement, bought it here, went to the football league, and they realised that. Because they think they, I think they thought we were front runners for a drug drug or something, I'm not sure of it. Because they spent 30 seconds asking me irrelevant questions at this football league. I don't know why I bother wearing a tie at the time, but anyway, we are with that. So it was me that they determined to be fit and proper financially, and they still considered me to be fit and proper financially. So there's no requirements to go back there and determine the same again for purposes of being in a position to afford running the football club. Okay? So I'm tired with money. I don't spend it with you nearly. I'm the wrong person for you, really. The truth, you know, you want somebody who wants to throw money at everything and not worry about the consequences. This is a business. It is an unusual business. Unlike any other business I've owned, this one's losing money. And that's an embarrassment to me because I don't like losing money. It's one where I can't control the outcome, that's control on the pitch. I'm in the face of you lot. That's something you get in no other business. And that's why it's so emotive, because I know what this business, I know what this club means to you all. I know. I've heard it, I've felt it, more ways than one. So, I'm sorry I'm sitting here, because if I be absolutely honest with you, I'm as gutted as you are that Paul's not here. I see Paul as my younger brother, the one I never had. It pains me the fact that he's not sitting here and we're going on the journey. But there comes a time in life where you've got to stand up and be counted. Principles are a thing that costs a lot, costs nothing depending on how you put it across. And I will need commitment. You're asked for things, well, I ask for something simple. And unfortunately, it wasn't delivered, and that's why I'm sitting here on my own. Next question. Um, 
let's just go back to how things were portrayed to you after the Oxford game on Sky. I think that's the night we became compared to the third if I recall. And Mick Adams did the interview, who's the right man about a football club? And I came out in shingles in Portugal. Bad place to plant the shingles all that sun. And I thought, Christ, what have we I was the first to have to put the money on, but I didn't really want to get involved day to day running the football club. Okay? When I came here, prior to spying the club, but, but uh, when I came back to the country, I didn't feel comfortable with the fact is that I would be deemed as a silent partner. And I asked Paul, was it substance or ego that I was dealing with here? He said, oh, it's definitely substance. I said, well, I'll be become the chairman then. He said, oh, no. no, 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 I'm chairman. I said, okay. And we achieved an excellent job. So nothing less mentioned to this club in his tenure. But I made a decision for several reasons. One of them was the fact is that I had a person put in front of me who was going to be the chief executive. And I wasn't happy with that decision, so I decided to take the role myself. One for both the person and also the cost. And I wanted to be involved within the football club, which is something that was never considered, and Paul and I had never worked together. So that, was a, that, that could have been the failure. I think it failed from the minute we started. Because there's two big, huge egos. You don't see it, but they are. There, there are two big, huge egos. I've spent 33 years of my life of being my own boss do my own wealth creation, that's related to myself and to that, and then my wife and then my kids. I paused at it for seven years. All right? That's a long time for you have to sit on your hands and not decide what you're going to do and do it. So it was difficult, but in the interest of the club, I decided that whatever we did, we'd work together as a team. I got, I sat on my own at Torquay. No officers of the club with me, Bill Logan's car broke down. I was on my own at the club, behind the goal where Calvin Andrews hit, his hit with the ball and we scored. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. I saw it. If you were there, you might have seen his backside, but I saw it, it hit his hip and it went for the goal. Prior to and after that, I heard the acid comments which were being addressed to Mickey Adams about him and his wife and his family which were in call for when we were second in the league, and there were 30 or 40 nonkeys, I would describe, and they're in the room, you're a nonkey, who decided to pick on our manager at the way venue, where we're winning, describe him of all things that I would never use, and I'm not the politest person in the, in the crowd, I'm anyway. And I went, I stood up, and the director of talking <coughs> saved my life. He said, where are you going, Norman? I said, I'm going to sort out my fans. And with that, there were two security officers that pulled me back in the chair and kept me there till full time. I think it saved my life, the truth, you know. And I realised that our inexperience in football was a, a big, big problem for this club. You may recall that Nicky went on the radio that night and actually said a few things about the fans, which you took exception to, or some of you did. But I listened to it first hand. And I realised that we've got a big problem. We're second in the league, we're winning games, and yet our manager is being verified like that. That wasn't acceptable. I went away for a few days, well, in fact, I went away for seven days. And just so you know, if you're looking at worrying about who's in the chair, in the last six months, I've taken seven days off and paused that six weeks. Okay? But let's go back to the story in question. I came back to the Bristol Rovers game. Not a very pleasant evening. Driving there was a nightmare. Paul had got his dad there. And we're sitting there eating our food and then the Ryan Berg scene kicks off. I don't have the technology in my phone that Paul has, so I, I let him get all wound up about it. And I kept eating my food. But that wasn't a problem. But in the, in the ensuing two hours, we had a game of football which wasn't going our way. There were a few fans who were a little bit upset the game. And when um, he just decided not to join us, a young player in question, we thought he broke his leg. I went down to the dressing room because I was concerned he might have broken his leg and I wanted him back at Stoke to be treated in people we knew and not take to Bristol uh, City's Hospital. As I came out, I saw a very heated discussion taking place in the tunnel of Bristol Rovers between Paul and Mickey. Not three or four days later, five minutes after the day, and I was very unhappy with the dialogue. Going both ways, we granted, and I pointed to Mickey and said, 
I bought this book, one of the main reasons because of you, and you're going nowhere. I walked away, and Paul walked away. And I realised then that we had real problems because we couldn't keep a powder dry and things weren't going our way. I then learned the following week that Paul took it upon himself to decide the fact is that he didn't want me involved day to day with the club anymore. Understandably, you can only have one person running the business, irrespective of the size of the business. It took him, and I expected him to call me into his life, what now, my gosh, office. <laughs> Did a great job at that office, I can tell you. I feel very comfortable in that his chair, although he's taking a good result. It took him four weeks, three, four weeks before he it got round to asking me into the office. I had like an infection child. Come into my office. <laughs> so I went in and sat down. All I were made to bear in mind, the fact is, we might have one crossword with you even now, although it might become strange going forward. And he said, We've got a problem. I said, Yes, we have. You can only have one company person in this club. Yes, we do. And we should. Sure? They said, Why are you agreeing with me? He said, I think you're saying this right. They said, I'd like you to convert your investment into a loan, that's the one on the quarter million, go and sit with the fans. He said the railway paddock, but of course I've got some limited questions for that, but he said in the railway paddock, and uh, when we need you, we'll call and you can give us a check. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, Paul, you're right. There's only one person who should run this club. And I don't, don't disagree with you, and you're the right person to run the club. You've got the persona. You come across well, you're a bright guy. But if you think for one moment, I'm going to walk out there, sit in the stands, and send you a check every February, you need to get off the pills. But this is what I will suggest you should do. We have three options here now. You either put in 50% of what I've put into this club, and we run the club as joint owners, joint chairman, and joint commitment. You buy me out, or you leave. And that was on the Thursday, and on the Friday, he started to email me about our urban business ventures, which I backed him on, which have since been divorced from one of the rental here. No acrimony here, I was putting the interest of the club first. Okay? Not a raise worth from either of us. So I went in the following week, and somebody made a decision, and basically he said to me, and he put this both in the email on the Friday and the Saturday, and again on the Monday. I quote, I do not want to risk my daughter's inheritance, young meaning beautiful, 12 months old, she's now a beautiful little girl, by putting it into a football club. I said, oh, it's okay to my kids to lose their inheritance, and that's okay, is it? They said, I said, well, Paul, in the interest of the club, I want you to go away and think about it. And for five weeks, I'd come in and say, have you made a decision? No, I've tried to go off and look at the, get the people to raise money to buy it, to sort them. Each week, I go in and say, "Have you made a decision?" And bear in mind, this is when we were. You know, this is the five weeks of the best period this club's had in the last 20 years. All right. So please think back. Forget the Wickham game, but start with the Burton game, or you know, the old shop, and so on. Just think about it. And this is all going on in the background. And so last Monday or Tuesday, I can't remember, it's been a long week. And I came in to him and I said, "Paul." Oh, he said, and it, it, all, it calls, he always calls me a young man, because I'm 17 years old, and I find that strange. But he says, hello, young man, what, would you, what do you want to talk about today? He said, Paul, oh, just one thing, can you please make a decision? And with that, he said, you can have it. Now, that took me by surprise. Because if anybody's ever profiled himself to the level that it, it's unbelievable. The only weekend before he gave an interview in the press about, and for those of you who follow it closely, I'm sure you know. And I said, do you realise how much you've betrayed people on that decision? Forget me, but have you realised that you know, how important this club means to people, that you can just throw it away just like that, what it is we're trying to build? So he chose not to invest, and he couldn't find anybody to buy me out. So that is no order and shuffle, reshuffle, no throwing the teddy out of the pram. For five weeks I'd go in and ask him, and sometimes text him or email him, have you made a decision? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. But it could, I said to him the previous Thursday, I can't remember what the reason was, this can't carry on. We need a decision. The whole place here knows what's cracking off, and it's just becoming untenable for us both. So on the Monday or Tuesday, last, this, uh, last week, he said you can have it. So what I've done is brought him out, of, not out of the club, 
but I bought it back in the other room. But Alchemy, which owns a chain of hairdressers, you wouldn't think it's different from my hairdresser. But it's, it's a chain of hairdressers which is complicated because he didn't want that either. And that was his business that I bought into three years ago, one of many things. He didn't want it, he wanted a clean break. And that's really where we are. He's been brought out, he has gone, and he's now playing with his horses. Or whatever else he's doing this time. The shock to me was that somebody could walk away from the profile he put himself through. That is what commitment is. That is a Gucci effect. I don't do Gucci and Okay? The last 10 weeks have been the most difficult 10 weeks of my life. Not because of the money. I could have walked away and left the money in the club. It wouldn't have changed my life. It would have missed me a little bit, but it wouldn't change my life. But for somebody to give hope and a future to, to actually then dismiss it the way it did, took it by surprise. And my wife cannot believe, because we always thought, I mean, he did try and I have to be honest, I think the bluff, I, he was hoping I was going to stand down on this point. I think that's what he was hoping, that he would stand down. Because he did say, no, let's just go back to how it was. But when I found out what was going on behind the scenes, it was too late. But not with Paul now, but somebody planted my idea in Paul's head. That we give Norman, push him outside, give him a chair. Give him a, I, mean, I have the most expensive seat in the house, as you know. But it was going to be even more expensive because I have no control about how the money is being spent going forward. So he's made his decision. I'm touched by that decision. Not because it puts the club in the worst position, but he made, a, he made a lot of things happen. You never normally get television crews to go off site to a media to discuss a football club. They normally come here. He even got them to go to one of our hotels to do the interview. That's unheard of. That shows you the capital we have at the moment, or did have, maybe for the last few days. So that's exactly what happened. So can I please also then get rid of the cynical view that he was waiting for the season tickets out to see what happened before, made, before anything was announced. Because that it just happens to have, I was just pressing for a decision and after five weeks I thought he owed me and the club and you guys what it is he's proposing to do. Okay? Keep it up. 
I don't think he meant about the football. <laughs> keep bringing your guys here, let them spend the money, but we won't bring any money to you because we believe we should keep it within our club. I found it difficult to try and relay that to you in the press, but I was, I was contented for it. Hey, so you went to Wickham, you spent a few bob, unless you're speedy, lives like everybody else has it. <laughs> Some of you have bought a um, special edition shirt. Some of you pay £40 to come to a sport for the year dinner at the club. I could go on. So we then asked you, within three weeks, all that having to stump up another lump of money for a season ticket. And I personally think that was a bridge too far. I believe, and I stated, that we should actually do it up to the 31st of May. And the reaction was, we'd have to demonstrate that we're serious. And by being serious and giving deadlines of that nature, we'll have a I didn't agree with it, and I still didn't. And that was why, actually, on Monday or sorry, on Friday, announced that the season ticket sales would be extended at the end of the month. It's a testament to you all that we've done that, but I think it was an unfair response to cram in. That cost mid-pay cycle. Because sometimes you're in an hour position, and like, you don't worry about what people get paid, apparently. It, it was wrong to expect people to stop for a load more money at a time when they've only just spent a load of money having a good time. So, so far, the season tickets have been great. And I'm going to maybe in a bit give you a crash course on how to run a football club. You'll find with me everything is direct. There's no way I can think. Sometimes it gets me into trouble, especially with the media. You get a bit of filter or condom to cook, you know, whatever it is you need to clear up most of the rubbish you said. Or both. <laughs> Mike gave me two condoms. <laughs> 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 I felt it was wrong that we actually put more pressure on you because it makes sense for you to be a season ticket holder in watching football at this club. Okay? If you can afford to, it's better for you to buy a season ticket than to come and pay on the game. For me, it's better for you to come and pay on the game. For, for the club, for the security of tenure, and for us to have a budget that we know is what players are going to go out for, yes, it's important, but ultimately, whatever the shortfall is, I've got to check it for it anyway. So the season ticket so far the next one. But I think everybody has the opportunity to take it all. And the second thing I'm going to say, as far as future investments are concerned, I'm going to set up a scheme for people now who pay £25 a month for next year. So that way, you can actually save money now towards the cost of next year. As long as you don't think I'm going to be bust, then you'll be all right. Okay, because that's what you should be doing now, planning your finances to support your club that you love. Okay? Next question. Mike, where are you? Up slightly, but not enough to bridge the gap. You don't like losing money. 
it's embarrassing that the club's losing money. We're going to have to do something pretty. It's an embarrassment. Like you just said, it, but it's an embarrassment to you. Really? At the club. I think we, we don't want to lose money. Okay. But I'm just interested to I've know what we're going to do differently. Okay, I've got the gist. You're assuming that I've bought the club Friday. Okay? I bought the club on the 20th of November. Whenever I buy anything, whatever it happens to be, I take a contingency. Now, when I bought the club, or put the money into the club that we bought on the 20th of November, I have to set aside a little amount of money on the expectation that will be called upon. And I believe that it will be. It's an embarrassment to me that the club's losing money, because I don't turn up to things that lose money. That's a barometer of pride, call it what you may. But this is a football club, and this is not a normal business. So I made, when I made the decision on the 20th of November, I made that decision then, what I need to do. Not now. Now is just an extension of that in the experience that Paul's not sitting next to me. That decision was taken then to ensure that the club had stability financially uh, going forward. The shortfall for last season was about 300,000. It's estimated this year the shortfall will be about 500,000 based on what we do. I need to qualify two figures, which sometimes when information comes from the press, it's never always relayed back in the paper script that people are reading. Our increase in costs have gone up by 30%. Uh, from bear in mind, because I sort of think there are costs behind the scenes as well as them. So the increase in costs of the club went up 30% last season, which we take into account the bonuses which have been paid in the the players and the manager. And this going, going forward, the increase in the budget is 40%. That's cost overall. Look, not most of that is players' budget granted, but there are other costs here as well as players. Speed is a better factor than all because he's making a mess of the pitch. Okay? So you would never, unless you're insane, and I'm not insane, I may be stupid, but I'm not insane, you wouldn't buy a football club on the chances that you're going to get out of it quickly. But can I share something with you? Since Friday, I've had so many offers to buy 50% off me, and on Sunday, so to buy the whole club off me. It's no matter what, there's somebody who have substance. First one I can't comment on. And I, uh, that's this weekend. If I wanted a quick exit, I'd have been gone by now. Right. Oh, I'm not suggesting. No, no, no. I understand, the, I understand the question, but I don't need. I can afford to take this club as I could do on the 20th of November to the Championship. Beyond that, I couldn't afford to fund it, and I won't. So, at the Championship level, we have a buffer if we get there. Because the shortfall, the next step, I see Peter Coase and what he's doing at Stoke and what the fans thank him for, or lack of it, in case may be. I wouldn't want to get into that very good All right? So financially, on my own, I can take the club to the championship. And I'll, if, the, if the ability of the squad gets there, then great. Okay? So, <laughs> well, there's another plan B then, eventually, to get the club that it's... You know, that it's paid its own way. Was is that where we want, want well, to be I'd, eventually? I'd like to think that people, you've got to look at If you take the last few games of the season, Burt Albion and Northampton, Burt Albion's a better game to discuss than Northampton. We had games which nobody would ever expect to see here again. I went to Wembley on Saturday to see Bradford, and they got 30,000 people in, in Wembley. If you've got a story, people come and watch it. And I agree, I'm a great believer that we have a lot of lost disenchanted fans who want to come back, and we've got to give them a reason to come back. And Burton was one, and the, and the run up to the end of the season, kind of about the same, forgetting our way for them, which is the good best in the league too, but I hope to be the case, but I've seen one the towards here, the best of the here. But we have a reason, but people only come back if there's a reason, and it's a good reason. They won't come back to the club. They won't come back if we just had five games in the room that we've lost. But they see that we're actually committed as a business and a club, and the fans, they'll come back. And I believe that. Um, and part of that's down to me, and part of that's down to you guys. I, I, you may recall, you know somebody that used to come in, he doesn't know how to have to bring it. I said that again, so that it was very fine for. These are all simple men, I know they don't sound very sexy, but they're all simple messages. You know somebody used to come here, get him back here, or her. It's simple. Because the more people we get to, there's no third party money being dragged out of this club. It's only a central payment. I don't pull anything from it. There's no money. This is not a, you can run my car or buy my house routine. This is everything that we have that comes into the club to go back into the club. It's that simple. 
If you put that shoe in the club tomorrow, it will put you in love you. Okay? It's nothing clever. But I made a decision back in October last year, I didn't make it this week. The only difference being is you didn't know it. Nothing else has changed. Next question. Seeing there's only you on the board, have you got any people in mind to come in to help you? On the board? Yeah, well, it's only you, and the new chairman, but we can't let you fall. Hang on, hang on. Let's just not get things confused, okay? Let me just give you a crash course in how to run a company. You have to have two officers on the board of a company. So my wife will co opt onto the board. Actually, she's a normal over business, so that satisfies the need for company's house and the football league. Your question is somewhat different though. You're asking me about how to run a company. This club has run the best it has been until we got a bit in administration. And all but one of the people that was in place in administration is still here. I don't want you to think that we should take the credit for most of the things that have been done as if it was us. I actually asked you all, you may recall, for a wish list. Remember that? John Booth, the commercial guy, who's got 20 odd years experience in football, I dare I say it's with a bit of but don't hold that against him, <laughs> had his list. And now when we cut out all the crap from your list, and came to the ones which were serious, and the clock wasn't on the list that John had, by the way, but it was several other things. We had two lists which were pretty similar to the first 10 or 15 items. So we implemented them. If you think I'm sitting here on my own, I don't know what you think we've been doing for the last six months. Okay, this club has been running. It has one person at the helm who takes all the credit when it's going well and gets all the grief when it's going bad. Which is at the moment, all everything we took, we turns to gold. Alright, so please understand the fact that you're dishonouring the other people that work here or put a day's work in but you keep the club running. It's not one man, one man fronts it. And I have to be poor. We did an excellent job. Did a great job on the radio, did a great job on the TV, because that's what it is for But there are people behind us and behind me who do this job day in, day out, and have got many years' experience in football. Out of the poor four people on the board of the, co the holding company, of which I was one of them, two of them are still here. And they're going to continue to be here until their job, one of them, until certain jobs are finished, the other one will be coming in, that's the finance director, on a job share with the business that Paul's got. So don't please see there's a vacuum. So there isn't. But this isn't a big business. I know it's big to you guys. It's a little business. It just happens to have certain things attached to it that you don't normally have with a business, which is the players on the pitch and you as the fans. If you're not happy with your milk and test pitch, you've got the same pitch. You can't do that with a football club. That's the difference. That's where the passion comes from. Alright? That's something that we didn't fully understand at certain games we had to put right. And I decided to take a course of action at that time. If you don't choose to pick on me, if you weren't happy with what Mickey was doing, then the squad would do it. Take it out on me, because there was no damage to kids on the, on the pitch. But there's no vacuum. The, this big idea that you have, you know, of this grand... It's a business which exists, and the people are here, and we're cheap to being here. So please don't fret yourself. This is not a big challenge. Apart from keeping you happy. <laughs> well, okay, you phrase that. This, the people are here. You're taking the, you're discrediting them by thinking that one man or two men actually are the people that are responsible for our success. There's quite a few people that never get heard of, never get mentioned. I want to do a roll call at our last hand game, but they refused to come out from the pitch. I thought they deserved it, they chose not to. There's quite a few people here for quite a few years ago to all together. So don't worry, we haven't got to back you. We're not, in any we're not in harm's way. Yes, I don't know much about football, running a football club, but I know a lot about running a business and how to make it successful financially. If we can get you guys a more into the ground, the rest of it will take care of itself. <coughs> Next question. Uh, hello, Norman. Um... We don't need to clap out of every state. We need it to the end with this one big push. <laughs> There was reports in the paper last week when all this broke that apparently Mickey Adams wasn't very happy with the outcome. Can you give us some sort of indication as, uh, as he calmed down now? Is he, is he happy with the situation? No, he's not happy with the situation. 
us, I, I've not really had much dealings with Nicky, just so you understand the fact that when I first bought the club, I saw Mr. Masai because he was a manager of player Coventry. And that's a difficult thing to change from a perception of a man who did a good job somewhere when I was younger, so to see, to becoming technically the owner and his boss, which I've never had, that never happened. I've never had any dealings with Nicky. And the handbag stuff, as I refer to it. Okay? I saw Nicky the other day. I spoke to him uh, before it was going to be, came out. He was very upset. This is his third summer that I've gone away. He's got stress and grief. He didn't think, you know, took the last two were bad enough. This one's for completely different reasons, but nevertheless, stress and grief he could do about. So he wasn't happy. Um, beyond that, all I can say is I'll see him Mickey tomorrow. Hopefully he'll agree a new contract. And then that's the sign of commitment that he wants. Because the guys from Rock for this club, we pay him well. We pay him well. We don't kind of see the stuff that gets thrown right up in the away games in particular, which I hope we never hear that again. If you're a true fan and feel that you should do that, go to Stoke, pick on the next step. Alright, so make you will be on board. But let's be absolutely honest about this, okay? Let's be let's take a devil's advocate. If a championship or premiership come along for Mickey tomorrow, I'll be disappointed. But in fairness to him and his family, he'll do what's right for him and his family as you would if you were put the same case. So we have him for a certain period of time, and when, he's, when that time is up, he's done a good job, the history books will show you what he's done, and he's gone on to better things. He won't go to anything worse than where we are. He won't, go to, he won't take a step backwards. He, that, he did that kind of shift in life, he won't do it again. All right? <laughs> and then that's the nicest possible way, especially when he's um, So, Nicky hopefully was on a new contract, but even when signing a new contract, if somebody comes along with a big box, he'll take it into a new contract. So we need all to understand that. That's life, that's progression. That's what happens in football. Alright? Next question. <coughs> so, what's happening about all this, uh, these businesses, what Paul said? Is uh, using it to bring into the laundry stand to make it uh, profitable. What businesses? Well, we don't know. Some people are bringing some chef business here, you know, oh, the academy business, and the stuff. Academy. Right, okay. Um, that, the academy business, which is something new now, I was never involved in the academy business, it's basically being the apprentices and the and you get some money to do with that. That was never going to be to the benefit financially of Paul Bale. But because of the profile of Port Vale, we may be able to attract certain kids that you wouldn't do at a college. That was a separate business, which would have, there would have been some rent, they rent some old, do and they continue to rent some space. But I don't think we ever judged in our business plan that the academy would actually put money into the football club. Well, wasn't we supposed to be bringing some of these old companies into the club to, to, to take up the space on Lord Street? He only has one of a business, and that's an academy. Okay? Um, if you, I'm sure you're not referring to his horse racing, which is a hobby. He has an academy business which trains apprentices in different disciplines. And here, he would have trained people in sports ground, catering, and, and very different. There would have been apprentices here, but that would still be the marine things out, because it, it, there's no way in the business plan there was money coming from that. So that was a separate business which would benefit the club, and the club would benefit from the profile of it. But directly, that would not bring any money in, as I see it. The only revenue this club's going to generate is season tickets, and spin-offs from season tickets. Uh, sorry, it's ticket days, you know, and spin-offs from season tickets, and uh, day tickets, and shirt sales, and beers, and pies, and all that kind of thing. There's no other savior, there's no other business. My businesses will be bought into the company that owns the football club and purely save the tax on those other businesses because this football club makes a loss. It won't assist the football club in any way, but it will assist me writing out a cheque for HMRC every year. Okay? Next question. Or perhaps in Wanderers, or bringing down sight more than Wickham Wanderers, hopefully. So, 
Will that make a difference? Well, it, I, I hope it does. I mean, my, our business plan that we drew up, um, we drew two business plans, one that we sent in to and one that we were promoting for us at the time. Uh, we're estimating, we, we've done a very, I, I'm a great believer in conservatism. I hate to be in a position where I overstate what I can do because it then you've got egg in your face and you can't deliver it. So we've worked on the basis of average attendance of 6,500. Now you're quite right, I'm hoping the first home game will be Wolves. And I think we'll have a packed away in. Uh, which will be interesting because that will be the first time that's happened in many, many years. But I'll take, so please, you know, bring the more, the more fans are coming, the better because it means it's less than that money I've got to put into the club. But I've worked on six and a half thousand. That is the, based on those number of attendees, paying attendees I may add, not people who turn up, that's people who have paid to be here, because that's another thing. You can have 10,000 people in the ground, but only 9,000 on the ticket, bear that in mind. Paying attendees, six and a half thousand, but actually, Dealing as well, I have a shortfall of 500,000. It doesn't take much, take it, but if it goes up to 8,000, for example, it doesn't have to put anything into the club. But I'm going to prepare myself for the worst. I did that in October last year. Next question. Don't you drop that pie? That's never lost. <laughs> With regards to walls, is there any chance? The law seat can be finished on the other end, so as that horse place can in there, which will bring back the sport. The law, that end will be finished, but it won't be finished before the beginning of the season, there's not enough time. Unless, where are you, Chris? Oh, you've run out. Um, I saw you somewhere, Chris, I don't know how you were, you are. Um, are you there? Do you remember Wickham? Do you remember Wickham? Baby. Well, do you volunteers if you need help? Yeah, well, mixing concrete and all that lot. Um, no, no, no. The, there are things have a lot of an effect. It's, for want of a better word, the first hole would be dug in the ground and rather than a new shop. It's today or tomorrow. The contractor are on site, start that process, and that will be in situ by a certain time, I can't remember the date, but it has to be in the city on a certain day to give us a new shop and ticket office. When that's free though, we lose the shop here. Which is then the future concourse of Black Park and Stan. But you can't put the cart before the horse, you can't have seeds about a concourse, because then you'll go for a pee. And also the fact is it doesn't need fire rate. I didn't want to bore the pants on you, but all I can say to you is that when I sat in the railway paddocks a couple of times during last season, it's an eyesore. All right, nothing, forget other things, it's an eyesore. But if you present me the problem that we've got a capacity crowd and I need to get more seats in the ground, then I'll be more motivated to go there and pick up myself. But we've got enough seats at the moment. I grant you the family area is not as fit for purpose for family purposes. But um, I think stand at the moment, it's not really physically possible to finish that stand at the beginning of the season. Next question. Right, um, this one came in late this afternoon by an email from Malcolm Hurst, North London Valiance. And it was addressed to Norman. Norman, have you mentioned the sizable investment going into the club from yourself? <clears throat> Are you able to confirm what form this investment takes? I'm oh, sorry, I thought you were reading all out. <laughs> Do you mind if I read the question and answer? Is that okay? Do you mind if I read the question and answer? Norman, being me, have you mentioned the sizable investment going into the club from yourself? I've never mentioned it until now. But I think you know where it's come from there, don't you? Yeah. You consider one of the courts of the rules to have been grand size of it. So we assume that answer is yes, sir. Yeah. Let's move on to the next question. Are you able to confirm what form this investment takes? Have you all been asleep for the last seven months? <laughs> <laughs> I wrote to check it out. For one I wrote to check out for one and a quarter million. Does that demonstrate that it was a uh, what form it takes place? Is that yeah. yes? Yes. If the investment is in the form of director's loans, are you able to confirm what rate of interest is being paid? <laughs> if interest free at the moment, at what point will interest start being paid? And is there a time scale that will be paying the capital? It's <laughs> not <laughs> <But> alone. <laughs> Next. 
Obviously, at the time of the takeover, we were debt-free. If, if there is any debt at this current time, is it sustainable for the club at the present level of income? There's no loan. Next. <laughs> have, no, have no problem with director's loans or interest being paid on them. Because it's my club, I thank you. However, I'm keen to know that the club is being run with its financial means, given the recent history of our club, I will put this above any push for promotion to the championship, Malcolm Hurst. There's no loan. Next. Don't clap until the end. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to. Next. Hello, Norman.
Would you consider bringing John Bush back into school once he leaves so sick and someone or not? I want to make sure you heard the question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you no consideration of that whatsoever. Uh, for two reasons. You have to be very careful when you have a manager of football, and I think you can all relate to certain clubs where bringing a director of football in, which is what I think you've been alluding to, kicks into the long grass the role of the manager. I'm trying to keep Nicky Evans, I don't want to get rid of him. So I think if he wants to come along here and do a bit of PR for the, for the club as a favour, as some form of return of what he's going to great, if he wants to come to certain games as part of some nostalgia, I'm all for that, but I will not. I'm not looking against the guy. I want to stabilise the ship, not make it even more unstable. So, but the most of the guy is, I'm sure, he's got a great CV. I don't see him having a place that he can do a full bail in the official capacity. Thanks. He talked about Bale's size of business. Hey, are. Oh, sorry. Um, he talked about Bale's size of business. Have you made bigger investments in other businesses than you've made in Bale? Yes. Correct. <laughs> this is a three million pound turnover business. Stoke Audi turnover more money than us. Okay? Please get it into context. Next year, if we do four million pounds this year, I'll be so happy. But we still want some of it will not reflect the number of cars that Stoke Audi sell at the dealership next to the uh, Britannia Stadium. You need to get it into context. Where's the Britannia Stadium? It's a, it's a car park on the way in on the A500. <laughs> park and ride. In fact, they're doing meet and veg at the moment there, so I'm a bit of pork if you look at it. Because the fact is that's where we bounce things off each other. 
But for those of you who think, I've just come back out from the sunshine to come and parachute and start this club. Sorry to disappoint you. Alright? This place has got a hold of me, and whatever's right for the club, I will do. But I will say this to you. If I'm faced with buying, taking in the chief executive on 100 grand a year, which I'll have to write a check out for in the first place, okay? I'd rather write a check out and have one or two kids on the pitch who's got a chance of getting a few more results in our favour. So can we please stop worrying about the day-to-day -day living in this club, all right? Once this little storm is over, it'll be back. I hate this expression, business is normal, because it makes you think of what you're trying to hide or what you're trying to hide. It's not a difficult place other than keeping you guys happy, keep the managers sweet and the players motivated. That's it. Now, I have to say, that's a job in itself. A much bigger job than worrying about what comes in and what goes out, all right? I don't, need, I don't need to know what players we're going to sign until Mickey or the representative sits down with me and says, this is the proposition. There's no point me getting excited with the press until I know what the facts are. It's a false start every time you think, oh yes, and that. I mean, I remember the Lee Hughes exercise. How that, you know, when we've got them and sign them, then you'll know. You won't be alluded to it before, and I won't get excited until I know they're in the back. All right? But we're in this club. I always to think that I'm a very intelligent, sophisticated, well-informed, good-looking. But let me tell you, there's none of them. It's not difficult. All right? It's a simple matrix. More people come in, more people buy drink, more people buy pies, more can be spent on the pitch. Simple. So can we break this myth? When we're in the League Championship, of course, I'm afraid that I'm a wonderful star. And it's been working at the mill day and all that rubbish. The most difficult part is dealing with media. It is a nightmare. 10 o'clock Friday night, I'm losing my rag and sense of what they're going to print because I wasn't happy. That's the most stressful thing I've had to do in the last week. Dealing with somebody, who I know, but it's been that's the most stress I've had to endure is dealing with a newspaper because they wanted to put certain things in which I think would make the situation worse and would be misleading because that's socialism, that's not the sales newspaper. I have very few friends, okay? But I've made two very good friends in person in the last six months, of which one of them is Mark Tabu, the Alright? And I see his counsel. And he has never betrayed me once. And he's been privy to most of this, but the whole but since I actually got off the plane. Alright? And he's given me the confidence to know he's a good friend. But he does work for a newspaper, so I have to be careful now that he's not trying to get running punch of promotion. But he's been a solid ambassador of this club for a long time helped me get in here and also took his advice if this went pear shaped what would happen going forward. Alright? So, you know, let's be so you understand. I want you to come along and pat the back to me and do a wonderful job. And it must be so stressful, it's so difficult, and it is. Okay? But it's not a job that I can't do. But please understand the fact that we've got a good team behind us. They're the ones you should be thanking. The people who go out there bringing in revenue, selling hoardings, putting food on the table, serving you. They're the ones you want to thank, because they're the ones that make the club great. They're the ones that never get mentioned. All right? Any other questions? You can have to have a mic from there, mate. I like your shirt, by the way. <laughs> I said, I don't think you had a Smurf shirt, but especially for me in October, November, it doesn't fit me now. <laughs> it's too big. <laughs> I know, Mede, you're doing a terrific job, but uh, we've got a couple of very famous supporters, uh, Robbie Williams and Phil Taylor. Have we been here before? Yeah. No, I just, I just wondered if perhaps if we could get them on side, they had a very good Didn't way of approaching. Didn't you raise this question last time? No, no, wasn't right. it? Okay. Let me be clear about this, okay? Isn't it a good job that I didn't seduce Robbie, and now you're thinking, what in Christ land have I signed up to if you read what's in the press this last few days? Okay? I'm a great believer that if you want to come out of the woodwork to support something, you can do it in your own time. Look how quickly Prince Charles come along. <laughs> if Robbie Williams came here, it would give me another £21 on the day, because they never buy their own drinks and you, that somebody else pays, alright? So please, let's deal with reality of who's in Burzum. If we're going to have a campaign, you know what the campaign should be? Keep it in Burslem, buy it in Burslem, spend it in Burslem. That's what we should have. 
Okay? I went to see the pottery that Prince Charles has put and, and I have no political ambitions. When you went to uh, Amina Curry, you remember being, it was all faith and poverty. Right? Until I found out that she was not in major, no one was sick. She went up in my estimation. Joan Wally is burst on through and through. She can be a real pain because nobody can ever question her integrity and her passion and desire for this club and for the area. If we, we need to engage with the community again, because this is what this is, a community club. We need to get the kids back in, and there will be 16 initiatives about that coming up shortly. We need to drive things through so that we can demonstrate to people we are good at what we do, we have a future, and we're here for the long term. That's what it's all about. Okay, so no celebs. Okay, I can't stand most of them, to be honest with you. The ones I've met, they're so superficial, they walk past you if they're on stilts, they talk to you like you're a piece of dirt, and they expect you to pay. Not my type of people. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate what you're saying, but you put a lot of money into the club that we were, so it was a bit fun. And years ago, there was loads of the females all wearing veil tops because of them. So if you go to one side... Oh, I see. So if I send him in his... I think it's a daughter, is it? Um, if I send him in his child a new shirt, that means the whole of Stoke will start wearing Port Veil vale shirts. But that I might consider doing. I'll have a look at the beat Conway. Father of a beer in the leopard and um, go from there. Let's talk about things that we need to do to make this club a better place. Okay? They're all simple things. When we bought the club, everything we looked at was broken. That was from the locks that get in here all the way through to the stadium. And this is a fabulous stadium. I've been to some real crap holes in the league soon. Okay? <laughs> Yeah, for those yeah. of you who the away from it, I can share something with you regarding um, Wimbledon. When we went away, it was a, I think it was a Thursday night televised match, if I recall. Turned in my Volkswagen Polo <laughs> at 60 miles to the gallon. <laughs> I drove because I get better at kind of my wife. <laughs> Turns up and we're given the allocated car park, gets out of the car, and the guy looks at the car, I think he said, um, come out and sit Oh, I mean, that's a, yeah, I'm representing Paul Bell. I don't sound the owner, but I think I, have to, you know, I represent Paul Bell. We're being tired. Tired of the change of the weight, they're boring, they're not sexy. They're being tired next year, you want to buy one. They'll be conditioned to be wearing the games, by the way. Um, they won't be following your trousers, by the way. Um, and the guy said, Would you like to eat? He said, Well, that'd be nice. It's taken me three hours to get to this wonderful stadium. I'd like to eat. He took me to a burger bar. <laughs> Since she the best of times, I can tell you. And we stand there, there she's in this new frock she bought for these monkeys. I wear the old Sentinel clothes, I don't worry about And she said, the guy says, Would you like ketchup on it? And I think, oh, well, I <laughs> This is true. Some guy then comes running across from a bingo hall and a yellow jacket says, oh, I'm so sorry, sir, you shouldn't be there, you should be in the bingo hall. I thought, Christ, it's getting worse. <laughs> so we go into the bingo hall to eat some rock hard chicken, which was freezing cold. And the gravy looked like it got lumps in it. And oh. it was wonderful. It's the things I do for this football club. <laughs> I think that was my first away time. That wasn't my first away time with my wife, but it was one of the early ones. And uh, we then watched the football. And for those of you who know, we were two real down at half time. And then one of the staff came up and said, It must be so embarrassing for you, Mr. Smurf. They don't call me normal because they don't know me like you, like you like do. They definitely don't call me Smurf. <laughs> or Papa Smurf. <laughs> which I take great exception to because I'm only 52, <laughs> and said, your football budget is twice ours, and look how crap you're playing. <laughs> so I've got to eat crap food, sit with people that don't understand the real world. Anyway, so we thankfully came back with a draw. On the return visit, for those of you that don't know, I'm direct to box at the moment at the back of the stadium. There's a league of pain, a new TV, quite proud of that little room. And it's got covers on the tables, not like bigger fleets on here, it's got white covers on the chairs and say, We're already posh now in Burton. So the, all of a sudden, 16 people from Wimbledon come, because they're a club committee, they're not owned by anyone, they're owned by the fans, big mistake. And uh, 16 people turned up because it was free. 16? So the, the, the guy who presented himself as a chairman said, Well, I just did this. Yeah. I have to apologise in advance, we don't do burgers here, but if you want me to talk about it, it's going to get you my dog. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't laugh. <laughs> the guy next to me 
Jackson did, because he was the guy that dragged me out of the wicket in the first place. <laughs> so the things I do for this football club. So let's just think about some of the things that we are going to be doing, or things that we should do, and what we need to do tonight. The obvious thing is to get every man and dog and woman back into this club. That's the first thing we should do. You have a duty to the club to drag them back in here and get them to buy a ticket. They don't have to buy a ticket. We have a duty to get them in here, all right? Because the atmosphere with 11,000 people in here is a little bit better than it is with 3,500. So I'll show you Grant, okay? After my little wind up at Burton, for those of you who remember, I was the before match performance or the entertainment. I'm going to be wearing, I would have wear a boomer's kit, it stinks, so I didn't bother. As I walked back off the pitch, the tunnel, and I need to tell you that I think I may have once said this, Ben Robinson, I've known for 30 years, a good friend of mine, owns Burton Albion. He came here with six bottles of champagne since his daughter's birthday that day. Didn't quite go to plan for him, bless him. <laughs> as I walked into the tunnel, I looked up and saw the players. As you lot were screaming, because I'd obviously helped you, you why know, the up, our players kind of grew like this, and the Burton guys went like this, and I said, what a piece of cake would be good won this game. The only thing I felt sorry for was the extra four minutes of Ben had to sit for an extra time. So that's what people can do. This is an inconsistent game. Just look at Wigan and Man City. Okay? You just don't know what you're going to get served on the day. But I can guarantee you that players will respond better if our stadium is full of people behind them that are presenting. That's not a simple business plan, but it's a plan. So we have an obligation for this club to get as many people as we can in here so we get the atmosphere right. Okay? There's been some things which have been signed off. One of them being the season ticket, which generally no correlation with why Paul's here or not here. That's just unfortunate timing. Obviously, the more people buy at season tickets, the more cost effective it is. There will be other offers coming along now we've gone digital for those of you. For those of you who bought a season ticket, have you seen your receipt? But you don't want to do that, do you? You look for, but you've got to disappear with your money and that's the end you're going to see it. Don't lose that bit of paper, by the way. Just so, you know, it's the receipt that you've given us some cash. There will be different permutations, which is one of the things we said we would do. And it's in situ now. Um, the catering situation I'm reviewing, just to have a look at the thing. I want to review the catering deal that we've, we haven't yet signed off, but we're looking at. We've obviously got the situation, we've got boxes which are up for sale, for those that want to buy boxes. We've got different permutations of seats now, we've got in what dining experience you want. I want to get this place like it was in Burton and Northampton, but Burton was a better atmosphere, than, if I'm honest with you. A better atmosphere that we got promoted, but pre-match, I think Burton is something that if you can sell that by the bottom, we'd make a lot of money. So anything we can do. So I come back to the fact that we had a question there seven months ago, and one of the things I think you could do with the back now is if you feel there's things for phase two that we should be doing. But I don't want stupid, monkey questions around. I want things that you feel will help this club put more money into it because you turn the inputs that back on the pitch. All right? And the supporters club will come back to you regarding how we deal with that. But I want, to be, I want this club to be successful because I think it, it's owed to the area. It's had such a checkered, disgraceful 10 plus years that I think now... This, I am sorry that you are here tonight because, of what, because it wasn't planned, it wasn't on the script. But we have to move on from that. There's a lot of good things that we're still doing. That hasn't changed. You'll be hearing things this week and next week. The only difference being is it maybe me, who isn't so photogenic, uh, who will be saying it. I'm, I'm not so good at the newspapers, I'm definitely no good at the camera. But there's a lot of things happening and will continue to happen. And the people behind the scenes are what are driving that. All right? So it is business as usual. Just sounds a bit hollow when you say it. I've now moved up one car park, which is for those of you to see. I'm sorry for the quality of my car, it's not to what you expect. But next week it'll be a Volkswagen Polo, a blue one. <laughs> I, I have lots of cars. I don't think it's right for me to rub it in people's noses in this area that I'm turning for some. Actually, I, have, I own a red Aston Martin. Can you imagine me coming in that? Really? Yeah, I bought it way before I ever moved in Port Bell with it. How long do you think that would last if I bought it here? <laughs> okay. I'd lose so much money in selling it, so I just drive it around the country and where I live. Alright? So I come in a boring Lexus or a boring Mercedes. Don't just people buy what they drive. Have you ever heard the expression fur coat and knickers? Okay? Just them by what they do. Alright? 
I don't buy anything unless it's in the sale. Sorry, ladies, I'm not stopping you on here. Well, I go up to the Marks and Spencer the retail, look the road that you've got, whatever it's called. Buy, I'll buy a trousers for a five or forty quid. I feel like that. That's me. I am a very wealthy individual, but I cannot accept and enjoy the wealth that I've got to have a guilt trip with it. So I don't go around telling people how much I'm worth. But let me tell you, if you're worth money, you don't have any debt. And it's simple to find out if you've got debt. Alright? This club has no debt, it will not have any debt during my tenure. Now, I could be here five years, I could be here twenty years, although I'm probably seventy two then, but you know. But we need to bring back the Bill Bell days. And we will. Okay? attending this official Supporters Club event. We hope to see you on the 20th of June. I believe the bar is still open for a bit if you want to socialise. Thank you.